Well, thanks for coming. Um, I didn't really expect so many people, but it's good to see you all. Uh, today, hopefully you'll be able to understand me firstly. <laughs> um, and if not, then maybe that's all to your benefit. <laughs> um, but rather than directly introducing the book by recounting an origin story or providing an overview of its contents, I want to introduce it indirectly by thinking a little bit about theology. And in that attempt, I want to think about theology in two ways. First, as a conversation with God, and second, as a conversation with Scripture. And in important ways, these two ways of thinking about theology get right to the heart of what motivates approaching the tree. So first, conversation with God. In trying to get to grips with what theology is, we can do a lot worse than turning to Theodore Weil's description of Frederick Schleimacher's understanding of religion as an experience of the infinite, and theology as the attempt to adequately articulate that experience. This, I think, is tremendously helpful, and I'll mention two reasons why. First, because it vi vividly illustrates what Anselm of Canterbury meant when he described theology as faith-seeking understanding. And second, because it makes very clear that all theology is not only dependent upon the revelation of God, but that theology is a, and perhaps the, proper response to that revelation. Together this makes clear that Christian theology is a product and an outgrowth of Christian faith. Or as Christoph uh, Schrobel describes it, <clears throat> from its earliest beginning, the Christian faith evolved theologically as thinking faith which receives the ground, purpose, and the criteria of its thinking from the way that God speaks to us. So that the word of God addressed to us evokes theology in response, our address to God in answer to God's address to us. Theology, Swobel explains, comprises our words about God in response to God's words to us. According to Genesis, God's words are the initiating cause of all that is. Rendered rhythmically with Robert Alter, the first verse of Genesis reads, When God began to create heaven and earth, and the earth was welter and waste, and darkness over the deep, and God's breath hovering over the waters, God said. Are elegantly summarised in the first line of the Gospel of John, In the beginning was the word. Together then, this is a double affirmation. God speaks. On this reading, creation is rooted in and springs from the conversation of God. Because all created things are created by the conversation of God, God's creation of each creature is the creation of a conversation partner. In this way, God's creation of each creature is also an extension of God's conversation. For humans who are created in the image of God, this has at least three implications. <clears throat> the necessity of human conversation, first with God, second with each other, and third with the rest of God's creation. Framed this way, Christian theology is the inevitable result of the conversational cascade that flows from the conversation that God is, to the conversation that God has with God's creation, to the conversation that creation has with God, which characterises Christian faith, and to the conversation with and about God that characterises Christian theology. When theology is understood this way, two further things become clear. First, that theology as a response to God's address is aimed at participation in the conversation of God. And second, and following, that theology's proper end is fellowship with God. So, conversation with scripture. This fact that theology is dependent upon the revelation of God necessitates action on God's part. God must disclose God's self. Further, it is because God discloses God's self that humanity can come to know anything at all about God. The chief site of God's revelation is Jesus, who as the incarnate Son is the self-revelation of God in human form. And it is in the particular person of Jesus that God's universal salvation is made available. This not only ties Christian faith in God to a particular event in human history, but the universal nature of its claims render the, renders that communication a necessity. For Schwobel, it was the necessity of communicating the faith that drove its committal to text. To maintain the identity of the content of the tradition, faith's communication through signs required the transition from oral to written tradition, and hence the dependence of all communication of the faith in the present 
on the text and shrouding the tradition. <coughs> this, Strobel suggests, follows the pattern of Israel's own committing to text, the uniqueness of its salvation history. Further, he asserts that grounds those texts in God's self-revelation. This has consequences for Christian theology because it binds Christian theology to this particular text that is grounded in God's self-disclosure. And thus bound to text, Christian theology is therefore always essentially exegetical theology. What that means can be articulated with John Webster um, when he says that Holy Scripture is the centre of theology. Not only does this mean that all aspects of theological work are directed towards the reading of Scripture, it means Christian theology is nothing more than the repetition of attentive reading of Scripture. For Webster, this means that in the church, the function of theology is to assist the competent reading and reception of Scripture as a summons to attentiveness and a reminder that we must always begin again with Scripture. In this way, Webster suggests, theology performs a particular kind of invitation within the church to read and reread Scripture and to hear and be caught up by Scripture's challenge to repent. <clears throat> One reason Scripture can be said to be the centre of theology is because Scripture as the Word of God is a chosen means of God's self-presentation to humanity. This Webster describes as the basic mystery of Scripture. The underlying the affirmation of Scripture as the Word of God is some notion of God taken into God's own service, a set of human writings, in such a way that they become an instrument of God's own address to humanity. Therefore, to affirm Scripture as the Word of God is to regard the scriptural text produced by humans as a textual embodiment of God's self-communication, and therefore as somehow offered, authored by God. Thus, to affirm these texts as the Word of God is to affirm them as a communication from God. However, understood theologically, communication involves much more than simply the exchange of words. Rather, in its deepest sense, communication is a matter of self-giving, a making common of one's life. Scripture, then, as the Word of God, or as a communication from God, is truly a communication of God. In and through and by these texts, God gives God's self to humanity. Further, because Scripture as the Word of God is a chosen means of God's self-presentation, and is therefore a self-given of God, Scripture functions primarily and fundamentally as a witness of God. This makes Scripture life-giving, and its primary life-giving function is its ability connect, to connect us with God by conveying to us who God is. It is this that makes the Gospels true. The accurate reporting of the historical happenings of Jesus' life is not the point. The point is the correct interpretation of those happenings, that Jesus is the Son of God, the Redeemer and Reconciler of the world. However, at the same time, because Scripture is a witness of God rather than a, than a full Lord theology of God, Scripture contains the stuff, or what Oliver Crisp has described as the conceptual building blocks with which theology can be done. It is the theologian's task to attempt to make sense of Scripture's witness by arranging the building blocks Scripture supplies, or to put it differently, coming to know God takes work. It is this kind of work that approaching the tree attempts in the form of seven interpretive essays and nine original pieces of art situated by the two historical <coughs> essays that Rosalind mentioned. <coughs> the interpretive essays had two tasks. First, to provide a comprehensive reading of the dream, and second, to gesture towards what that reading reveals about God. In this way, the relentless focus of approaching the tree is on encountering the God communicated by and witnessed to in Scripture. If in this way approaching the tree is an attempt at theology as conversation with God and Scripture, that no two readings of the dream can be entirely reconciled, even as each provides a convincing interpretation of the dream, hence towards a third type of conversation that theology necessarily is. Conversation with others. In 1 Nephi 11, Nephi begins to report his vision of a tree. This report, however, contains a curiosity. Caught away in the spirit of the Lord, Nephi finds himself on an unfamiliar mountain, engaging the spirit in conversation. The spirit asks what he wants, and Nephi replies, to behold the things which my father saw. After establishing that Nephi believed his father saw the tree, the spirit rejoiced and told Nephi that he would behold the tree which bore the fruit which thy father tasted. 
and then telling Nephi to look, the vision erupts, and the first thing Nephi sees is the tree. This perhaps should be our first clue that the vision of Nephi is not a straightforward repetition of the dream of Lehi. Before seeing a tree, Lehi encountered a dark and dreary waste, a man in a white robe, and a large and spacious field. Nephi immediately sees a tree. It seems this tree, however, is not the tree which his father saw. Instead, Nephi reports it was like unto the tree which my father had seen. In doing so, Nephi subtly distinguishes his experience from his father's. As his vision continues, it seems that Nephi learned an important justification for seeing a tree of his own. The tree he discovered is the love of God. If God is a loving being, then God is a relational being. And love as an emotion orientated towards others requires the existence of others to be experienced or expressed. Love, that is, presupposes relationship. And one's relationships with, his, with others are as diverse as the others involved. Thus, while God's love sheds itself abroad, each necessarily experiences that love uniquely. As with the trees of Nephi and Lehi, individual experiences of God's love are like unto, not the same as. If the proper end of theology is fellowship with God, and if Holy Scripture is the centre of, the, of theology, because Scripture as the Word of God is a chosen means of God's self-presentation, and is therefore a self-giving of God, then it follows that individual encounters with the text of it, redemption will elicit a variety of experiences. God can comprehend us, but we cannot comprehend God. Once we realise this, something else becomes apparent. Conversation with others about God expands our own vision of God. This is particularly the case when those conversation partners have significantly different life experiences from our own. Toward that end, approaching the tree places a variety of interpretations of the dream in conversation, scholarly, artistic, and with the contribution of our friend, the Reverend Andrew Teal, cross denomination. <clears throat> Writing in 2018, Patrick Mason wrote that the 20th century was the century of Latter-day Saint history, before predicting that the 21st century would be the century of Latter-day Saint theology. Um, and how into historians predicting the future you are, <laughs> that's up to you. Um, but he continued, if we are to be a serious global religion, this will necessarily be the case. If Patrick is to be proved right, then much of that seriousness will be found in our doing theology as a response to God's conversation, in our doing theology that begins from and returns to the conversation with Scripture, and in our doing theology and conversation with others who transcend the boundaries of our particular disciplines and faith community. In attempting to discern the richness and depth of Lehi's experience, we hope that approaching the tree contributes towards the recognition of the Book of Mormon as theologically robust and redemptively significant. Thank you.